for better days to come and carry us like wind in our sails. Hold on tight, I can smell the shore, it's right in front of us if we just hold on tight. This vision that I saw is getting closer every dawn. Dreamers of the Welcome to episode six of the Free Achnitz podcast. Um, you're all really welcome here. Ruben's going to come in and say a quick hello. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for the help, Ruben. Yeah. Ruben's helping me out with my camera okay. setup. I'm going to go make flags uh, in Minecraft. He's going to go and play Minecraft now. So, uh, yeah, you're all really welcome here. And um, just wanted to say uh, I'm absolutely overwhelmed by all of the new subscribers. So very welcome to all the new subscribers. A uh, big welcome as well to all of the returning viewers and um, yeah, I'm just thrilled that uh, this podcast is reaching so many people and that people are liking it. Um, yeah, so I, because of the number of subscribers we've got, I have a giveaway because we've reached 500, over 500 subscribers on the channel and that's absolutely brilliant. I'm thrilled with that. So we're going to do a giveaway and I am going to send to the winner, um, this is the wool, two skeins of Studio Donegal's Darnie, so that's the four ply, um, fingering white wool uh, and um, absolutely gorgeous Irish um, spun and dyed wool from Donegal, from Kilcar and Donegal. Um, so all you got to do is uh, subscribe if you haven't already, like uh, the video and um, write a comment below and uh, just saying what project you're knitting on at the moment. So this is my cat Gatto who's come in to, <laughs> to join the podcast. By the way, I should have said in the introduction, my name is Anya, um, I'm coming to you from the West of Ireland and this, uh, the content of this podcast is mainly about knitting. But I do uh, include a little bit about Irish culture and uh, history um, and uh, a little bit about the, the seasons and uh, native Irish plants and trees. Um, and this podcast is no different. I'm going to include a little bit at the very end uh, that's going to be talking about a particular uh, megalithic monument that I came across recently on my travels and, and I took a bit of footage of it for you. Um, so yeah, that's uh, so today's podcast really is all about um, just, I suppose, celebrating the 
the big uh, subscriber numbers is very exciting um, that giveaway so if you just want to be in with a chance to win the Studio Donegal yarn um, just like and subscribe. Um, I just wanted to say a few words actually about Studio Donegal. They're one of the sort of longest standing Irish wool producers in Ireland but they're probably better known for their weaving um, and they've actually kept a, a tradition of hand weaving in Ireland um, and uh, so since 1979 they've been uh, working the old looms and uh, producing absolutely stunning um, uh, mainly sort of households wear like, uh, like uh, rugs, uh, hand woven rugs um, but also uh, Donegal tweed for um, for garments um, which is sold all over the world um, and it's absolutely stunning material and they actually have all of the uh, the operations happen in Kilcar and Donegal including the um, um, the weaving on the old hand looms, the hand weaving and also the sewing up of the garments um, and they they get their they source their wool or their yarn from um, a, uh, a spinner, a, sp um, a mill in the same town in Kilcar, Donegal Yarns, um, and they they choose their own uh, method of uh, producing the colours and dyeing, and really it's the colours that are particularly exciting. I think are particularly beautiful, and um, they they really are stunning. Um, I don't think they've actually got names. I think their numbers, but this is a lovely sort of almost a sort of raspberry colour and this is an absolutely beautiful green colour. Um, so that's the the prize and I'll, I will draw uh, using a random comments generator, I will draw for the, the winner in the next podcast which is going to be the weekend of the 17th of December. Uh, so watch out for that. So I have a lot to show you today um, and actually I have so much to show you that I'm deciding to do a second podcast um, I'm going to divide up the, the material and uh, I was hoping to get that second podcast done this weekend but that's actually not going to happen so I'll do that um, before the uh, before Christmas before the, the end of December so I hope you're all well I hope you're all relaxed and sitting in a, a nice cozy place um, hopefully with a, a, a cup of warm hot beverage with you, hot tea or coffee um, for these dark days of the winter if you're in the northern hemisphere of course if you're enjoying the start of summer down uh, in uh, Australia or New Zealand or in the southern hemisphere wherever in the world you are uh, I hope you're having a nice cool drink. So um, yeah one of the most exciting pieces of news I have for you this week is uh, that I have um, launched a, or at least published uh, my first ever knitting pattern on Ravelry and um, that anybody who follows me on Instagram will, will know um, that the pattern went up there on Thursday I think last so it's literally just fresh off the, the press mind you the pattern has sort of been languishing in my um, in my folder, in my computer for over a year um, it's taken me that long to well first of all get the the uh, design test knit for me and a big thank you to my amazing knitting friend Barbara who uh, did the test knitting and um, gave me great feedback um, and edits which were um, which were used to to improve the the pattern before it was released and just to ensure that it knits up correctly which it does um, but if there's anybody who wants to to, to buy the pattern and sees any issues please contact me um, on my either through Instagram or through Ravelry. Um, I'm going to show it to you now it is called the reindeer cow and it is knit in a DK weight um, alpaca yarn and this is what it looks like it's got a series of reindeers I actually think when I was designing this I was inspired by the, the, the likes of the low relief uh, stone carvings on the frieze of the Parthenon. That's what it reminds me of, the, the, the uh, uh, horses marching across the um, uh, the frieze of a um, of the Parthenon, of Greek, build a Greek temple. I'm going to throw it on and show you how it can be worn. Uh, so yeah, it goes, it can be doubled over. So 
goes like this. I have a mirror in front of me here so I can actually see what I'm doing. So yeah, this is the, so you can have the reindeers showing like this. You can tuck this little bit in here. So it's super cozy, super warm. Um, really, really good, especially if you live in a very cold climate. I mean, sometimes in Ireland it's a little bit too warm for this. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's the reindeer cow. So basically it's knit in stranded colour work. Um, and as you can see, there are quite long stretches between the strands. Um, but you can just, uh, there are uh, links to YouTube videos in the pattern which will show you how to manage your strands if you're going for a long section where um, you need to, to weave in your strands along the way so that you don't get puckering in the work. So that's all explained to you in the pattern. Um, it is a, literally it's, it's folded over so the strands don't appear on the inside, which means that you can wear it really comfortably if the strands won't get caught. In, in your clothing. So uh, yeah, that's, this is the uh, this is the reindeer cow, um, and uh, the is there anything else I want to tell you about it? The it's literally just a folded over piece of material with a three needle bind off on on the end. Um, yeah, it's uh, really really cozy. I really recommend it. So that's the that's the reindeer cow. Um, you can always wear it just simply as a scarf, fold it over underneath your coat, um, it gives you give great warmth there and uh, because of the way the, the fold over is done, it has this lovely sort of, um, you can just wear it almost like a, a sort of a, a cowl effect um, neck, just like that. So I'm really proud of this design and I'm so delighted to be able to offer it. For sale on Ravelry um, and that's another thing I've decided to donate the proceeds of the sale of the, uh, the pattern at least up until March 2023 for a really deserving Irish charity called Focus Ireland which helps uh, has advocated and uh, for and supported people experiencing homelessness in Ireland since the 1980s and um, sister Stanislaus Kennedy set it up and um, I have huge respect for her and for her approach to dealing with this really desperate issue um, and it, her work continues on um, and yeah so you can um, be supporting a really good cause if you invest in the pattern as well. So it's available on Ravelry and it's under my name, my actual name which is Anya Doyle. Um, it's not listed under Freachnitz. Um, I don't know why Ravelry um, required that I, I do that, but that's the way the pattern is, is now listed. So it's Anya Doyle if you're looking for it, and it's Reindeer Cow. So that's the first item that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, the second thing then is I wanted to uh, just go through my finished objects with you. So the first finished object that I have to show you is this. Um, so it's blocked since the last time I was talking to you. Um, it's the Stephen West Mystery Knit Along 2022 Twists and Turns. I'm going to put this on to show you how stunning this is and how I like to wear it. So, again, just checking how things look in the mirror. So, basically, that's it. It is um, absolutely so my favourite part is the uh, beautiful cables here um, and also I love the um, the waves on uh, on the border uh, so yeah that's the the twists and turns and as you can see I have had to use a uh, leftover or not leftover yarn but I did run out of the pink and um, so I ran into the uh, heart the life in the long grass heart and um, for this section here so for those of you who haven't seen my last video um, the yarns here are Life in the Long Grass um, Flower uh, Bud, Flower Bud I think it was called the pink, um, and um, Life in the Long Grass was also uh, the green, um, and this grey colour here is a uh, Pearl Soho yarn, it's Lynn Quill, um, I forget, oh it's still water blue. Um, and then I had 25 grams also of the another pink colour, um, which is Green Elephant hand-dyed yarns, also based in Ireland. 
um, and I think it's Rally Racer was the name of that particular yarn. So yeah, um, I absolutely love the shawl. It's a crazy mad design, which I probably never would have knit if I had seen it, but because it was part of the knit along, I just went for it um, and really got into it and would definitely do it again. So great fun. And as well, the fact that I managed to use up um, yarns that I had in stash um, and they were just one skeins. I literally just had one skein of the uh, Pearl Soho yarn and I had 25 grams of the Rally Racer, the pink I bought one skein of, there was only one skein left in the shop in Life in the Long Grass. Um, and I had 80 grams left of the, um, of the green colour from a, uh, that's called Hillside by the way, that colourway, Life in the Long Grass Merino Singles. And I had, um, I'd only got 80 grams left of that from uh, the turntable pullover by Albion of Glochlin that, that I knit earlier in the year. So for me, this was a great project to actually use up all of these leftover yarns, or at least leftover skeins, and combine them with um, with others. So just give you a look at the back of it. I actually, as you can see, also ran out of the pink and ended up using um, green. I had more green left over. I still have a tiny bit of green, actually. Um, that's it. So it's just... Uh, really fun knit really really exciting really just great to follow along with everybody um and yeah just see what see what came of the the mystery uh so it's definitely worth doing it's definitely a brilliant thing to do so that's my only finished object because i didn't actually get finished the other major project i've been working on which is the um Billy Pullover. So, Billy Pullover has advanced to a little bit farther than it had the last time. I now have sleeves, and I'm not sure which is the front and which is the back. Yeah, this is the front of it. So this is my Billy Pullover. Um, sleeves are, took me so long, I really didn't anticipate that they would take me as long as they did. Um, so I started this in September, but then I got caught up in the mystery knit along in October. So actually, uh, it's probably been about two months knitting, September and November. So we're at the end of November now, and I literally just have the hem to finish, to finish off. Um, I've literally a few rounds left of the hem, and I have the stitches to pick up on the neck. Now I'm actually going to modify the neck. I'm not going to do a uh, fold over neck because I think it'll just be too bulky so I'm just going to do a simple flat one piece neck uh, I'm going to keep it as wide as I can I don't want it bunched up uh, around my neck um, and I'm going to do the same bind off that I did for the sleeves so I'm going to do this uh, the it's the one that's recommended in the pattern by Sari so I think it's called the Italian sewn bind off um, and I'm going to do that for the hem and I'm going to do, do it for the neck and I've actually done it once before, only on one sweater, which is the one I did for Reuben, the Stop the Store, Stormore, I think it's called, um, the Icelandic sweater, and it took me ages to do it, but it was really good practice because I've got a bit faster at it. Um, it's a really lovely stretchy bind off. It makes it look like the knitting is just going over the top of the hem. So you've got this beautiful, um, you know, really nicely finished look. And, uh, it's actually very similar to the technique for doing a Kitchener stitch, which everybody gets terrified about when they hear the name, a Kitchener stitch. But I've found some great tutorials online that actually um, really make it very simple. Uh, and you have a mantra in your head, which is like a rhyme, which helps you to remember where you're at in your, in your Kitchener stitch or your Italian sewn bind off. So I'm so excited to finally you know, get this off the needles and, and start wearing it. It's absolutely adorable. Um, and I, had, while I was knitting it, um, this is why I have too much content for you this time and why I'm dividing this video into two, uh, or at least the content into two videos, is um, I am going to do a video on the history of Aaron knitting. Uh, because while I was knitting this, I started to get really curious about history because I. I realised I actually knew very little about it 
I didn't know where it had come from. There are so many myths surrounding it and that's part I suppose of the charm of the Aran sweater is the myth factor but um, I'm going to be looking at a couple of essays uh, by particularly one knitter who you may already be familiar with and that is Alice Starmore and uh, in her book Aran Knitting she has I think probably the best assessment and analysis of where the style came from and the history of it uh, and I've also been looking at a new publication by um, an author called Vaughan Corrigan uh, who writes on fashion and she traces the history of the iron sweater as well in this book published only two years ago, three years ago I think 2019 called Irish Iron History, Tradition, Fashion. So I'm really looking forward to sharing that with you, but that will be in a separate video um, because it's really too much just to fit into, into this one. Yeah, so that's my Billy Pullover. Um, I highly recommend this as a knit. It's really, really enjoyable. It takes forever, but sure, look, that's the charm of knitting, isn't it? That uh, it's really the process that's important. Um, I am going to share uh, another work in progress with you um, and this one is by uh, a French knitter um, and I'm just going to have to check my notes there to see exactly what uh, her name is. So she's called, um, let's see if I can find this now, it's called the Kelias Shawl or the Kelias Shawl, K-E-L-I-A-S, I'll put the name on the screen here um, and um, the designer is Lilo Fies or um, this is a Kelion, I think Berangère is her name, I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Um, she's a knitting designer from the north, the north of France and um, so I started knitting this shawl um, which you can see is still very much a work in progress. Um, this is what it looks like so far. Um, you can see that. So I started knitting this immediately after I finished. Hello again. Um, I'm sorry, I got interrupted there a second ago with the camera only accepting 20 minutes of footage. Um, I still have to get that special piece of equipment that allows me to video for longer periods of time. But for the moment we'll be stitching pieces of video together, which is fine. So this is the Kayleigh S shawl that I was talking to you about. I can't remember exactly what I had said to you about it, except that it is a really enjoyable knit by a uh, designer from the north of France um, and who is, goes by the name of uh, Lille Office on the um, on Ravelry and uh, she has designed this beautiful short rose shawl with uh, rows of eyelets um, giving beautiful pattern um, throughout the shawl. So I'm really enjoying this. It's a really nice, it's all garter stitch so it's really easy um, I've never really done lace before and I sort of feel like I'm actually sort of, you know, getting into the lace thing with doing the yarn overs for, for these holes, for these rows of beautiful uh, holes in the shawl. Um, what I wanted to say to you in terms of the colour, the inspiration for combining these two colours, because these were both in my stash. So one of them is Hearth by Life of the Long Grass and it's Merino Singles. And that's the orangey uh, burnt umber colour and the, the beautiful aqua is water green by um, um, Machita Malabrigo, Malabrigo yarns and it's, it's, uh, the name is Machita. So again, that's um, a merino singles yarn. Um, but it was really Amy Palco from The Meaningful Stitch, uh, who I watch all the time. I love her uh, podcast. Um, she used, used colours similar to this in her um, Stephen West's Mystery Knit Along Shawl. So I actually got inspiration from her um, and she talks about um, her yarn colours um, looking a little bit like the various stages of oxidation of copper. So that's exactly what I think this looks like where you've got the beautiful pristine copper 
in the lovely hearth colour and then in the aqua green you've got the oxidised copper just like the dome of a church or a cathedral after the copper has been exposed to the weather uh, and to the oxygen um, so, and the water of uh, weathering. So I just love this colour, uh, this combination. And this shawl is giving me great joy at the moment. It was cast on as a, uh, a sort of a spontaneous cast on after I finished the make along, the mystery knit along um, by, by Stephen West, because um, I really got into the idea of knitting a shawl. I mean, what's great about a shawl is that you just don't have to worry about sizing or about gauge or anything like that. Um, you don't, you're constantly with the, with the sweater worrying, is this gonna fit? Um, am I going to like it? Uh, is it going to look like it does in the pattern? Whereas with the shawl, it doesn't really matter what gauge you're doing or and there's no sizing to worry about because it all just gets bunched up around your, your neck anyway at the end of the day. So purely, uh, pure pleasure. Um, really just loving the way that the um, that the yarns actually, uh, the colours come out when, when you knit with this beautiful variegated uh, merino singles from Life in the Long Grass who are absolute geniuses um, in terms of the way they dye wool, uh, just absolutely gorgeous. Um, yeah, Caroline I think is her name, she's just a, an absolute artist with, with the way she dyes wool. So very lucky to have them producing wool or dyeing wool here in Ireland, um, so it's easy for me to get. Um, and they ship all around the world as well, so it's uh, it's a really good. Uh, I can highly recommend Life in the Long Grass, as you probably know. Anybody who's watched this video before. Um, is there anything else I can say? This is being knit as a present for a very special friend, um, and uh, yeah. So I'm not going to say who it is because uh, I want it to be a surprise in case they're watching this podcast. So that's that. Um. What else did I have to talk to you about today? So I wanted to just say that, um, yeah, they're all my works in progress at the moment. I know I have other works in progress which you've seen already, but I haven't made any progress on them, so I'm not going to include them in this podcast today. Um, but one thing I did pull out for uh, to look at, to resurrect from last year, is a project that I never finished. And um, so I suppose you could call it an unfinished object. A UFO um, and it's a Lopa Pesa or a, uh, an Icelandic uh, sweater and uh, this is it here so I'm not sure if this is the front or the back it's actually the back so this is the sweater and it is um, as you can see not finished but it is absolutely gorgeous. Um, there's some colour work in the at the bottom of the sweater in the hem, uh, and on the sleeve cuffs, um, and then there the real feature of the sweater is uh, this beautiful lining. So because this is knit with uh, Icelandic wool, which can be quite rough, and isn't great next to skin, even though actually I don't really mind it. I find. Um, it depends on the temperature of your own body. If you're, I think, if you're too warm, it starts to get prickly. But if if you need it, if you need to be wearing it, you don't feel that, which is absolutely incredible. The way the skin sort of has this symbiotic relationship with, or that the wool has a symbiotic relationship with your skin, depending on how hot your skin is, and um, or how warm you are. So this is Icelandic uh, Plutolope held double. So you can see in the, um, you can't actually, it's above in the, uh, I'll get it down for you. So this is the wool here. It is, comes in plates like this and it's unspun wool. Uh, I'm sure many of you have become familiar with this because it's become very popular. So it's unspun wool, which uh, breaks very easily like this, but it's extremely strong when um, you're knitting with it. And, uh, and apparently there are lots of versions of this now, um, but apparently the Icelandic version, which this is, Futilopi, is one of the stronger versions because of the long fibres in the wool. So it actually doesn't break as easily as other versions of uh, unspun wool. But what I've done with this sweater here is I've held the Futilopi, I've held that double, so I'm getting, this is supposed to be 
I think close to a DK weight when it's on its own, held single and held double you get an iron weight or worsted or iron weight and um, so it's substituting the pattern codes for Letlopi. Um, now Letlopi is a spun wool and it's uh, an iron weight uh, so it tends to knit up to a slightly bigger gauge though when you're holding this double so it's not exactly, it's not an exact replica at all. So I had a little bit of trouble uh, managing, I'll show the, the issue I had in a second uh, on the sleeves where I used uh, Let Low Pea as well. So anyway, to get back to my point about the reason that there is a beautiful designer, by the way, is uh, Diana Walla, um, our Paper Tiger, also known as Paper Tiger, and uh, the name of the sweater is the Moon Pulls Sweater. So she has this gorgeous feature of a lining and I have used for the lining this particular yarn here, which is a, um, this is a chained yarn. It's a, I think this is a very light fingering weight. Um, I'm going to put up the details below. Um, it is a, a yarn by Rowan. Uh, I, I'm actually struggling to remember what it is. Oh yeah, Rowan Camello. Um, so made from merino wool and baby camel fibres and um, so it's 65% wool, 18% camel fibres and 14% nylon. Uh, I knit a scarf out of this uh, about, I don't know, maybe two years ago and so this is leftover wool and uh, I'll show you the scarf at some stage as well um, because I really love that. But So this was left over and I was able to, the pattern calls for a different yarn, for cashmere I think it is, uh, for the lining. So the lining gets folded over um, and sewn down on the inside and you end up with this gorgeous effect. You can sort of push this up a little bit so you get this lovely effect of, a, of the lining coming up. Now the reason that this got put away and forgotten about is because I said, oh, I must, when I tried to fold it over I realised I hadn't made this lining long enough. Uh, I needed to be longer so I had to go back and pick up, uh, rip out the the bind off and pick up the stitches and knit a few centimetres more. I mean it really won't take very long but you know the way these things get put on the long finger. So very simple small amount of work and the same with the sleeves. The sleeves are these fabulous um, garter stitch sleeves. So you can see that I went from knitting with the yarn held double, the Plutalopi held double, uh, through the colour work to Letlopi uh, and I struggled to get <laughs> The gauge to match between the two so I have a little bit of an issue going on here which is hardly noticeable actually uh, where the gauge changes so it goes a little bit wider uh, after the colour work um, but you have this gorgeous gorgeous cuff which is like a glove it, it comes down over your hand um, comes right down and it's like a glove over your hand and then you've got this gorgeous uh, soft soft um, well in my case the camello Rowan camello with the camel fibres underneath so you've got you can leave it and this again I want to make it a little bit longer so that I can leave it so that it does that so I have this gorgeous feature at the end but that basically gives you stunning uh, I mean it, the cuff comes to about there on me in the way that I've knitted in the length of it it covers right up to the the top of the, the hand so that's that sweater there's another lovely feature at the bottom which is um, more garter stitch. So a garter stitch hem, it's just a stunning idea rather than doing um, yeah rather than doing a ribbed hem you have this garter stitch and uh, I just adore this colour work. So the colours, um, this lovely coral colour I actually got from a, a seller on eBay a couple of years ago as well who was getting rid of leftover bits and I've never come across the colour, I think it might be it might be a discontinued colourway in Let Lopi. Um, but I really wanted to incorporate it into a sweater. I just love the look of it and I finally found this pattern to incorporate the lovely coral colour into it. So it's a gorgeous, gorgeous sweater. I think it's going to look really well when it's finished. Um, so that's my unfinished object for today. Oh, by the way, the construction I should have said to you, the shoulders are, it's a raglan shoulder um, and a really beautiful detail. I don't know if you can see that of the raglan sleeve and so I love the structure of a raglan sleeve actually. I think I prefer it nearly to a, 
uh, to the rounded yoke. I mean, they all have their place, but I think that was one of the features of the construction of the sweater that I was attracted to when I saw it on Ravelry. And as you can see, the holes under the arms, which need to be sewn. Um, yeah. That's the unfinished object. So, um, that brings me on to, that is the, the sum total of my knitting at the moment. Um, it brings me on to the uh, acquisition section. So this time I have a, um, an absolutely lovely acquisition to show you and that is this skein of yarn here, which is a very big uh, skein of 250 grams worth of um, Irish yarn. So I know I mentioned a couple of podcasts ago, I think probably in my first, first or second podcast, that it's really hard to get Irish wool or uh, Irish yarn made from wool that is uh, bred and, and uh, from sheep that are bred and reared uh, here in Ireland. Um, but the situation is changing, thankfully, and this is something that I really wanted to highlight to the world, to anybody who wants to, to, to hear about it, that um, thankfully, yeah, the, uh, the wool industry here is beginning to change. It's, it's at a really cusp sort of point where um, it's almost um, the realisation is that the, the model of um, the organic food industry, which is thriving here in Ireland at the moment, um, could be used for uh, the, say, the processing and sale uh, and breeding and producing of Irish wool. Um, so yeah, this is I wanted to buy a skein of this. This is actually from Life in the Long Grass, but uh, it's called Heritage Yarn and Galway is the name of, of, of the, the yarn. But it's sold by a lot of different uh, companies, Irish companies. Um, and it, it all comes from the um, Galway Wool Association Co-op. I hope I've got that right. Uh, the Galway Wool Co-op, sorry. So um, to find out a little bit more about the Galway Wool Co-op and the work that they're doing, um, I got hold of this, this is another acquisition, this amazing magazine called Slow Fashion. Um, so this is the story of Irish wool, um, which is going to be the name of this podcast. Um, because actually I just think it's so important that uh, everybody gets hold of, anybody who, who has any interest in, in Irish wool or knitting with um, the yarn that is... Um, absolutely indigenous to this country, then I think that this story is uh, really interesting to read. Um, and there are contributions from people who have, um, who are involved in promoting Irish wool. And one of the contributions is from Sandra, Sandra King uh, from Irish Fibre Crafters. And I know they've been going for a long time. And I know that, that um, a, another great podcaster who's a uh, real name escapes me, but she's the uh, Wild Cottage um, podcast. I'll put the uh, all the details in the description below. Um, but she is uh, podcasting um, from County Clare, and she is um, she contributes to as a member of the Irish Fibre uh, Crafters Group, who uh, promote Irish yarn and Irish wool. She hand dyes yarn and uh, grows organically um, the dyes for, for doing that. And um, But Sandra King anyhow runs, uh, I think, heads up the Irish Fiber Crafters Group. So she has a contribution. And then there's another one from Blanad Gallagher, Gallagher, who is the co-founder of the Galway Wool Co-op. Uh, by the way, this magazine is produced by Aoife Long. Um, absolutely stunning production. And uh, this is just volume two. It's, the, it's very, very new, uh, the magazine, Slow Fashion. So, yeah, the story of Irish wool. So I thought I'd tell you just a little bit about the, um, that story as, uh, in terms of the contribution made by Blanet Gallagher in, the, um, in volume two of the Slow Fashion magazine. Um, so she has... Um, really is is devoted to promoting the wool of this specific breed of sheep which is the Galway breed um, so even though um, there are lots of different um, producers 
growing are, are, are producing wool from different breeds of sheep in Ireland, all on a very small scale. Um, but this is the start of promoting a large scale production uh, through a cooperative system of a breed of uh, wool from a breed of sheep that is the only native Irish breed to exist um, to have survived. So uh, yeah, that's that's really the the, the um, that's where this is this is starting with that breed. But actually, this could be replicated. This this system that Blood of Gallagher and the Gallagher Wool Co-op are um, promoting and uh, marketing could be used by all uh, different breeder groups and breeder associations in the country. And hopefully, it will be. You know the start of, of, of things really taking off taking off. Thanks, Ruben. Okay. Hello. Hello. Hello again. <laughs> I'm off to play Minecraft again. So, okay. <laughs> so Ruben is just helping me to reset up again after I uh, got interrupted and um, I was That's in the middle of favorite. talking about yes, you can yeah. Um, I was in the middle of talking about uh, the Galway yarn. So. Um, just show that to you again. That's it there. So this is the beautiful um, Irish um, indigenous Irish sheep breed, the Galway breed, and this yarn is produced by the the Galway um, wool co-op, or at least the wool is, and then the yarn is spun by various different people. So this came from Life in the Long Grass. Um, uh, they produce their uh, their own. Um, hangs with and um, or at least it's uh, they buy it in and sell it so um, that's where I picked up my my skein and it's absolutely gorgeous 250 grams skein so I could do a lot with this I'm not sure what I'm going to do but um, I think I was talking to you there about how um, this is a scratchy or it's it's not a soft yarn definitely not but it's very very crisp and it gives great definition, so perfect for using cables and uh, anywhere you just want really clear definition in your knitting. And um, I was thinking of, uh, even though it is rough and uh, I really like rustic yarns and I was telling you about there about um, Icelandic wool and having knit the Moon Pulls uh, sweater by Diana Walla. Um, you know, I think that uh, I just, I find they're not scratchy and I have a feeling that um, it'll be the same with, with the Galway wool, that it just, just depends on your own personal uh, sort of uh, sensitivity to, to, to rustic yarns. Um, I did have a theory that the closer you are in, in the world in terms of your sort of ethnic origins to the colder countries where this wool, uh, the sort of rougher wools, seem to be um, produced. Uh, like we can't produce merino in this country because the, the climate doesn't allow it. So um, this just rougher yarn here, uh, you know, I think that possibly the people who come from this part of the world are more able to, to deal with it and possibly the same with Icelandic wool. Um, and actually, it depends on as well how warm or how cold it is. I think I think an Icelandic sweater can actually feel less, can actually start to feel a bit prickly if it's too warm and you shouldn't be wearing it. Uh, so um, that's a theory anyway that possibly it's to do with our DNA. Who knows? Anyway, I was thinking of making a pair of socks out of this, and you might think that's actually a bit crazy um, in terms of the scratchiness. But also there's the issue of would a pair of socks last in this wool? I'm thinking of making um, sort of like a pair of cabin socks with um, like ribbing, you know, two by two ribbing um, or even three by one ribbing, which I adore, uh, who knows? But I was thinking then of pairing it with, um, with a mohair. So with a Rowan, I have some of this in my stash, Rowan Kid Silk Mohair, Kid Silk Haze it's called. And by pairing the the um, the silk mohair with the rustic yarn, it would do two things. It would give extra warmth. It would uh, extra softness rather, because warmth really isn't an issue. But uh, 
give extra softness and it would also act as a, a substitute for nylon so the silk would, would, would strengthen the, uh, the fabric uh, which would be really a good thing if it's going to be socks so actually that's what I think I'm going to do with this and I'm really excited to knit with it um, particularly because you know it is indigenous it's 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 part of who we are it's uh it's part of a, a new enterprise a burgeoning appreciation for uh, a raw material that we can produce here you know it's it's reducing all of the transportation and air miles and all of those things and it's giving uh, a, a fair price to the farmer for for the wool for the fleece um you know because in ireland at the moment um, I can't remember the statistics we have, um, I think we have nearly as many sheep here as people, I think it's 3.5 million people, uh, oh, sorry, sheep, we have 5 million uh, population, but 3.5 million sheep, and the average, um, so the average fleece size uh, is 3 kilos, Ireland produces 10 million kilos of wool annually, which is 11,000 tonnes for Americans. Um, if the wool leaves the farm, it's exported to the UK and used to make carpets and huge amounts no longer leaves the farm because uh, the wool prices are so low. Um, shearers charge three euros per sheep and wool merchants um, pay 20 euros a kilo or 60 cents per fleece. So um, it costs the farmer 2, 40, um, two euros 40 per sheep. So um, uh, and there are 30,000 sheep farmers and it's just, I mean, we, it's a big industry here. Sheep farming is huge, but most of our sheep are reared for their meat. So, um, but if, you know, if that wool could, okay, not all of that wool can be used for yarn because it's maybe, it's not the right breed, it's too rough, but there's a huge potential for that to be used in building insulation. And there is a big push uh, policy from the government to upgrade 500,000 homes. Uh, to more efficient energy um, rating by 2030. Um, and Europe's largest producer of insulation, Kingspan, was located in County Cavan and could they pers be persuaded to use the Irish grown wool and it's, it's thought that yes, this is a possibility. So this is all information that I'm getting from this amazing article in the, uh, the publication that I showed you there, this low fashion, the story of Irish wool. So it's absolute like essential reading for anybody who's interested in what's happening now. It's a very exciting time in the Irish fashion and slow fashion industry. Um, that's the name of the magazine, Slow Fashion by Aoife Long. So uh, yeah, this is, you know, there's so much wool being produced in this country that's actually being wasted because there's no way of, the, 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 the farmer is not getting a fair price for it because they, the, the farmers are not being connected up with industry and um, yeah there's so many uses um, the interiors industry of interior fashion so rugs and throws and um, cushion covers and stuff like that um, is, is huge a huge potential as well but also then there are the knitters like ourselves who um, can delight in actually using this absolutely beautiful stuff so can't wait to, to knit with that um, I think I've probably touched on uh, most of what's relevant in terms of, of those recent acquisitions, very exciting acquisitions. So the last thing then, <coughs> before I talk about the uh, Irish cultural history section, um, I just wanted to let you know a little bit about what I'm wearing. I spoke about this anyway in the last podcast, so I don't really need to tell you much more, but just for those who haven't seen the last podcast, um, this is a sweater designed by Yonko Komoto and it is called the um, the twig sweater and it's one of my favorite sweaters um, it is knit in old centrum two ply um, wool uh, Gotland wool and I think both undyed they are three there are three colors there's a brown a cream and a gray now I've put the actual numbers of those um, colors in to one of the comments on the previous, somebody asked me what, what the, the actual uh, numbers were and I've put them in there in the comments in the last podcast. I can also put them down below here as well for anybody who's interested in getting the same colours. But um, this is knitted a really tight gauge and uh, so it's really warm. I absolutely love it. I just love the design. I mean, the colour work is absolutely stunning. The only drawback is, as I said before, the neck is not 
uh, perfect. It uh, is a little bit flaring out a little bit and I do need to, to redo it, but I haven't done that yet. So there are all these, uh, it's terrible, there are all these little uh, alterations that should really be done before I call a project finished, but um, I'm sure you can identify with that feeling of wanting to wear the thing uh, and not um, ripping back and completing, but this will be easy to rip back and to knit on a smaller needle. I just knitted on too big a needle size for some strange aberration of the mind that when I was knitting it, I don't know why I did. Um, so yeah, Yonko Komoda's twig sweater, um, I absolutely love it and it's perfect for this time of year when it's getting when it's getting colder and I really love the sleeve detail which is a 3 by or 4 by 4 rib actually I think, uh, 3 by 3 um, and it creates a sort of a, um, a balloon sleeve here which is a, a crazy in a way combination of two different I suppose styles of garment where you wouldn't expect to find something like this in a rustic, maybe a rustic uh, wool and uh, colour work garment. There you go. So it really works. Um, yeah, so that's it. And um, the next thing I wanted to talk to you about then is the uh, the cultural section. And it's only going to be really short this week. Um, uh, I have some footage of a megalithic tomb, which is no, located very close to me here where I live in the west of Ireland and um, I just thought it was so magical that I really wanted to share it with you and I wanted to I suppose link it as well the significance of this tomb which was which was built um, in around 2000 BC so uh, that's like 4,000 years ago or so the significance of it for our connection with the uh, I've talked a lot about wool and yarn and coming from Ireland and sheep breeding and actually that's around the time that sheep, well, sheep breeding would have been well established at that stage. So farming began in Ireland around 4000 BC at the beginning of the Neolithic period I think and these tombs date to the end of the Neolithic period, uh, the New Stone Age. So they, uh, it's absolutely fascinating to think that that farming has practices have been going on for that many thousands of years, and uh, and that we have a uh, a monument, an actual physical structure, that it was built by the people who were rearing the sheep at the time, and who presumably were using the wool for making garments or making, um, yeah, making garments, spinning and weaving, particularly uh, would have been, would have been around, I think, going back that far, and uh, possibly not knitting, which is much later, but uh, but certainly weaving, uh, which connects back up with Studio Donegal, again, which is, just to remind you, this is the yarn I'm going to um, give to whoever wins the, the giveaway. This is Studio Donegal Darney. So, uh, who the Studio Donegal company run a, uh, or they weave, um, on hand looms. So, and the name of the family who, who runs it is Donaghy, uh, Tristan Donaghy. This, I'm going to put a uh, link to a really a gorgeous little short film um, where Tristan Donaghy talks about the company, which will give you a real flavour for how authentic it is and how incredible it is that they've kept those hand looms going and what beautiful, um, what beautiful stuff they actually produce in terms of uh, throws and blankets and um, interior uh, wares as well as um, as well as garments. The the, the Donegal Tweed uh, garments come from their company as well. So, yeah, the the fact that weaving is so so ancient and uh, the um, this megalithic tomb is a connection to that those people, you know. So. Um, when I looked up the, so the name of the site is called the Shrawi Megalithic Tomb and when I looked up a, a website just for some more information about it, um, I'll link it down below, it's uh, Meg Megalithic Monuments of Ireland, it's a bit of a, a tongue twister. Um, first of all they describe the area that the tomb is situated in and it's absolutely fascinating to um, yeah, to just to, to, to hear the names of the uh, of the townland and the, the local features, geographical features, and the name of the tomb itself in Irish because it's like it's like poetry and it's like a voice from a long time ago, possibly not as far back as two thousand BC, but certainly you know at least a thousand years old. Um, so 
you know, this physical structure and the names, this intangible culture of names, townland names, of, of place names, of field names, is for me absolutely magical and fascinating, and particularly because it's a preservation of our native language, uh, often just then translated, anglicised, translated into English. But I'll just give you uh, a flavour of them. So there's the actual um, tomb is called Tuberna Haltora. I'm going to put up a photograph here so, so you can see what the place looks like before I show you the footage at the end. So the, the Tuberna Haltora is the um, the altar of the well. Tuber is well, um, or it's the well of the altar, sorry. It's the um, Tuber as well, Nahaltora of the altar. So why is the word altar coming in there? Because these megalithic tombs were places of burial and uh, not necessarily uh, places of uh, celebration of um, um, or worship. Uh, but they were used as places of worship during the penal times in Ireland and uh, during the time of the penal laws, which was sort of uh, anything from the 17th, um, 18th century, uh, right up until about 1829. And uh, the penal laws were laws of suppression of the Irish culture and the Irish people, so you weren't allowed to uh, celebrate your uh, um, religion. Catholic religion was not allowed to be celebrated. And so uh, churches, people were, were moved away from churches and into celebrating at mass rocks. And mass rocks are a rock in the middle of a field where mass would have been said. Uh, and this megalithic tomb was, was used as a mass rock. It was used as a place for celebration of, of mass during these times of oppression. And there is a, a, a stone, uh, sorry, there's a cross, Catholic cross carved into the top of the monument. Of course, we'd probably consider that sacrilege these days, <laughs> but it's just another part of the story of um, yeah of the of the evolution of the of the people of the country. So Tobin Hall Torah, um, so it was an altar, but it was also a holy well. So holy wells are a big thing in Ireland; they're everywhere. Um, uh, they abound on the Ordnance Survey maps which were produced in the 1840s first and the second edition produced then in the 1880s. Um, they are really detailed maps produced by the British actually for ordnance, uh, for just understanding the, uh, the topography of the country and getting details. But they, there was a, uh, uh, an arm of that, um, of the ordnance survey that was to do, that, that actually paid uh, people to look at uh, cultural objects. So John O'Donovan would be a big name in terms of um, the, the research and uh, noting on these maps all sites of archaeological interest including holy wells and these tombs and castles and everything. So they're just a wealth of information. So the holy well, um, so it was venerated as a well and it was also used as an altar. So it was a site that began way back in 2000 BC but had such significance for the people of the land right up to up to today even. Um, on, so Shrawi is the, the other name given to the tomb and that comes from Antra we I'll put the names up, meaning the Yellow Holm or River Meadow. Um, and then it is located 100 metres east of Loch Nahaltora which again refers to the altar, Altora, and Loch is a lake, so the lake of the altar. So this altar gives, giving its name to, so these names then dating back to penal times at least. Um, Shrawi presumably dating back even farther than that. Um, Karaniski River then is located 400 metres to the west. Um, the Irish name for that, Awan, Karu, Anishka. So Awan is a river, Karu is an area or a quarter and of on Ishka is of the water, so the, the river of the area of the water. And the tomb was located then just uh, 1.2 kilometres northwest of the village of Craigon Bon. So on Craigon Bon, meaning the White Rock, and six kilometres south of the town of Lewisburg, which the Irish name for which is Coon Ciar Bon, meaning the meadow of the buttercups. So, so poetic. I really think that place names give such poetry, and they're all connected to nature, to geographical features. So we have the river meadow, we have the area of the water, we have the white rock, um, we have the holy well, we have the meadow of the buttercups, um, we have then the Shifri Hills located to the southeast, 
Knuck Shifri from the ancient family of Makshafri, who formerly held the ground here. Apparently, this is according to this website. Um, and then the Mwil Ri Mountains, I think this is a beautiful sounding name, Mwil Ri, and the the Knuck Mwil Re, which means the flat topped hillock. So, all of these geographical features named um, in relation to their connection to this beautiful site, uh, this megalithic tomb. So, um, really, there's not much more to, to tell you about it. Uh, we know that wedge tombs were introduced to the southwest of Ireland around 2000 BC, and it's thought that they came from the the, the building type came from France at the time. Um, and this was the close of the Neolithic period, and these tombs continue to be built on into the Bronze Age, and they abound in the west of Ireland. An idea of scale, um, it's actually quite a small uh, structure. So 4.2 metres long is the gallery part of it, and the large chamber is 2.8 metres in length. And then there is a, um, a single roof slab. And this is the amazing thing, is how did these people build? How did they lift such a huge piece of stone onto the top roof of the, the monument? Um, but this single roof stone measures 2.4 metres by 2.1 metres by 200 millimetres deep. So uh, a pretty big slab of stone and um, by any standards. So yeah, I'm going to uh, put in the footage at the end so you can see the magic of the place. It's taken on a really windy, wild day in the west of Ireland. And I hope you get a flavour of the uh, the remoteness of the place and how incredibly just special it is. And um, you just get a, a real uh, insight into the past and the connection. We still have this connection with the, the ancient past here. It's so lovely to see that. And uh, just to be reminded yeah, that, that the people back then were doing the same thing that we're doing now with the wall, presumably uh, using it to keep warm and uh, yeah, to provide clothing for themselves and to provide warmth and blankets. So um, that's it and I'm going to finish off the podcast by reminding you once again about the, um, the giveaway and I'm going to post these two skeins of yarn of uh, Studio Donegal Darney to anywhere in the world for the lucky person who uh, who is picked out by the random comment generator that I'm going to use. Um, so please uh, may, uh, leave a comment, uh, like the video, subscribe if you haven't already subscribed and you'll be in with a chance of winning this beautiful, beautiful wool um, from Studio Donegal in Kilcar in Donegal. Um, and finally, I'm going to remind you, I'm going to show you the cow once more, just to remind you that you might think of buying uh, the pattern and supporting what is a really, really good cause. And i uh, just going to show you again how you can wear it and how beautiful it actually is. Uh, so yeah, enjoy um, the winter with this beautiful cow uh, if you're so inclined and you'll be supporting a really good cause and supporting people who are homeless in Ireland. Uh, so thank you so much for watching. It's been an absolute pleasure to be with you once again. And uh, I really love sharing all of this information that I'm so fascinated to find out about, uh, about things that are local to me and uh, things that are giving me joy in my life. And uh, knitting all the way through it, which is what we're here for. Um, it is really just the most amazing thing to, to, to do. And uh, yeah, so... Thank you very much for watching and uh, thank you very much for all your comments. Thank you very much for subscribing and uh, take care until I see you the next time, hopefully in about three weeks time when I'll be picking the winner of the giveaway. Thank you. Talk to you then. Bye now. A stranger in the night Take a chance for some romance Don't cover your eyes We're trees Know you better than anyone else It's time you let your guard down For someone like me I'd say I'm 
Go with someone like me 